Welcome everybody to another edition of Historical Geocaching on the Road with Geocacher TN Photobook from Chattanooga, Tennessee. Dude, I am so excited right now. My family and I are in northeastern Alabama, just west of Bridgeport, on our way to Russell Cave National Monument. It is a Russell Cave is a really cool national monument established by President John F. Kennedy back in 1961 because of all the ancient Indian artifacts that archaeologists were finding in that cave. And so we're going to be going on a ranger-led tour of the cave. Yeah, there's some really cool history there, some really cool nature. It's, there's even an earth cache and a traditional I'm going to try to pick up as well. This definitely counts as historical geocaching. Come along with us as we visit the one, the only, Russell Cave National Monument. Oh yeah! Okay folks, we are here at Russell Cave National Monument just in front of the visitor center. Want to show you the incredible, I know it's um, kind of hindered by some of the trees, but really cool mountain, just glorious day, beautiful mountain views. Come around here, and here we go is the visitor center, and a really cool um, National Park Service emblem here. Another reason I'm really excited to go here is because this is an actual national monument which is part of the national park system and I'm going to be able to get another stamp in my national park passport. Yippee! There we go. Another stamp in my pass passport. I am... Ranger Antoine Fletcher. I've been here for several years, but that doesn't matter. Uh, what matters is the prehistoric people being here uh, since 10,000 BC until 1650 AD. Now, I will tell you before we get started, we've been seeing snakes, uh, copperheads, and black rat snakes, but you guys know to stay on the boardwalk behind me, which uh, that's fine. Yeah, he <laughs> gets out the boardwalk. We're seeing them. We we started seeing them like three or four weeks ago, so that's pretty odd. But just be on the lookout for that. Uh, right now, you might see a couple of five line skinks, uh, some swallows in the cave. Those are not bats. Those are swallows. So you don't have to freak out about that. Uh, pretty much what we're learning about today are prehistoric people. Most people do not think about the prehistoric people, they think about Cherokee Creek, uh, Chickasaw, the historic time periods. But these people were here thousands of years before the Cherokee, the Creek, and the Chickasaw. These people crossed the Bering Strait Land Bridge 10,000 years ago and trekked their way to Russell Cave. Uh, they didn't know what was, what was on the other side of that Bering Strait. They just was following the mastodons and the mammoths, and uh, they kept on coming down to Russell Cave. And you'll see why they stayed here. The main reason is the resources. You got your uh, cave shelter that we're going to see today. You have all the plants. You have water that goes into the cave shelter constantly. So this was a perfect place for people to live for thousands of years. Um, when, you, when I say prehistoric, what comes to mind? When I say prehistoric people, uh, what kind of people do you think they were? Does the word primitive come to mind, maybe? No. Yeah, yeah, kind of uh, like the Geico commercials used to be, those type of guys. Well, funny enough, a lot of the things that we know about today, bows and arrows, blowguns, atlatls, which I'm going to show you guys, a lot of the hunting methods, 
uh, agriculture all came from these primitive people. And that's what we're going to talk about today, how they really wasn't primitive. That's just one of those words that's associated with prehistoric people. But uh, first, we have to learn the history of Russell Cave. Now, as we walk up to the boardwalk or up to the cave, if you have any questions, just stop me. I probably know it all. I've been here for eight years. So, <laughs> so all right, let's go. Starting with Russell Cave itself, it's 310 acres of land that's been passed down since the 1700s. Uh, Russell Cave was a homestead in which revolutionary, a Revolutionary War event received the land. Uh, and his name was John Woods or Chief Tuchester. Chief Tuchester was one of the only Cherokees that did not have to walk the Trail of Tears. And his home still stands today a couple of miles down the road. We do not know where he was buried and we do not have a photo of him. But we do have a little bit of history on it. From Chief to Chester, it went to James Doran. Did you guys see the sign for Doran's Cove? Yeah. Okay, so James Doran was the second landowner here at Russell Cave. And he sold it to Thomas Russell. And that's why it's named Russell Cave. Thomas Russell married it to the Ridley family. The people that sold this land to National Geographic. And National Geographic excavated a little bit and gave it to the National Park Service in 1961. So May 11, 1961, it became the only national monument in Alabama. So now, besides the landowners, we could talk about Russell Cave itself as far as plants, vegetation, flora, and fauna. Uh, Russell Cave, like I said before, has about 800 vascular plants. We have about 80 species of trees here. You'll see a lot of buckeyes, uh, black walnut trees that they would have used, cedar trees. Uh, we do have bobcats at Russell Cave. Plenty of bobcats. Uh, deer, sometimes we get, uh, what is that, armadillo in on site. We get beaver, uh, the list goes on. My favorite animal here is the great horned owl. You'll see a great horned owl from time to time. I love them because their wings are serrated, so when they fly, you can't hear them. And sometimes you'll find owl pellets out here as well. Now. You know, I talked about the natural resources of the cave and why, you know, Native Americans or prehistoric people picked Russell Cave. Now, looking around you, can you pick at least one thing that they would have used in order to survive here at Russell Cave? You can pick a plant, a tree. It had more than enough wood. Well, look at this umbrella-like plant. That is a may apple. Yeah, that's a may apple. You have these little greenish yellow apples that will come out of the bloom. And they used to eat these apples. The apple is edible, but the plant is not. So anytime you see a like an umbrella plant, then it's a may apple. Um, let's look at this tree. This is a basswood tree. It was a medicinal tree. They use it for headache and stomach ache medicine. They will boil down the leaves. These elephant, well, that's a buck, that's buckeyes. These elephant like leaves, they will boil those down into a tea. That's what they would do. So this was, this is your basswood and those are made apples. So as we go on, actually I can show you something else. This is the uh, tallest blue ash in Alabama. It's a champion tree. It's huge. <laughs> yeah. We don't have many blue ash trees in uh, the park, but this is one of them, and luckily it's a champion tree. Now, as you come up around the corner, you're going to see the third largest cave in Alabama at seven and a half miles. 
And this cave is composed of Pennsylvania sandstone and logstone. You guys can you guys can line up around me and we'll talk about it a little bit. See, I'm always amazed on how did they find this place? Like, how do you find Russell Cave without a GPS or a Google right. Map? It's, it's amazing how they found this place, but they did. I don't know if they heard the water rushing or the wind from the cave, but what I do know is it was the perfect place to live for thousands of years. Now, this cave shelter, the entrance is 110 feet in width and 100 feet in height, and it goes underground almost 300 feet. Very large cave. Again, it's seven and a half miles straight or the passageways, and that was that was pretty much, they got that date in the 70s. So it could be a lot, you know, longer now. It could be eight miles. Because Russell Cave is alive. And what I mean by that is the water is always rushing. With that water always rushing, you're always going to have erosion, okay? So, some people ask me, where does the water go or where does it start? This water starts all around you. What you're seeing is rainwater that's just getting to Russell Cave three or four days ago, finally getting here. So you got this surface water from Montague Mountain that we're on now. That goes about 2,400 feet above sea level. You got a little mountain to the left, which you can't see. It's not worth your time anymore. It just blew, this stuff blows out so fast. And then behind you, you got Ore Mountain. So Montague Mountain, Little Mountain, and Ore Mountain all bring water here to Russell Cave. Now, under there, it can come out at 300 gallons per minute when it's really rushing. You can't see it on the left, but there's a dry creek bed. And sometimes Russell Cave will flood up to where we're standing. So I've been able to put my foot in the water before. And that will drain out in about three to five hours right outside here. Now, as, as this water goes in, it doesn't go through the whole cave. It actually goes about 100 yards in, and then it dips to the left and goes under uh, ground. Western Kentucky came out in 2005, and they started putting dye in the water, and they detected that it goes all the way to the Tennessee River. So it has about a 10-mile journey. Now, I mean, think about this. You have a major resource here. You got they can boil water, they can have water to drink when it's really hot. The cave is 57 degrees year-round, so when it's cool or warmer outside, you go inside the cave. When it's 20 degrees, you go inside the cave, start a little fire, you got everything you need. Besides that, what do you think lives inside Russell Cave? Since there's water running through Russell Cave, do you think there's any living organisms inside Russell Cave? Bats or other animals? There's, yep, there's bats. We have northern long bats here. We have the endangered gray bat. We have tricolored bats or pipistrellus bats. Out here we have the eastern red bat. It loves to live in the brush and leaf litter and in oak trees. And we keep on finding bats too. We have about eight to nine species of bats. A very low population because it floods so much and because of white nose syndrome. Does anyone know what white nose syndrome is? White nose syndrome is a fungus that kills bats within 90 days. Uh, the spores of white nose syndrome gets on humans and when they go caving, they take it from cave to cave and then the bats contract it and then the bats die. Uh, how you know this white nose syndrome is when bats will fly in the daytime, they have this erratic pattern of flight. Sometimes they'll walk just walk on the ground a lot, yeah. And you'll see little white splotches all over their body. Had a guy ask me, he said his cat was acting crazy. Can a cat get white nose syndrome? No, a cat cannot get white nose syndrome. His cat was just crazy. <laughs> <laughs> People kind of freaked out after we uh, put the newsletter out there. No, just small mammals, but bats are usually the ones that will get it. Um, the bat... The people, huh? excuse me, the people who lived in the cave, yeah. when it flooded to that degree, um, where did they go? Yeah. Well, when we go in the shelter, that's where they live, in the shelter por portion, but they would move up on the mountain. 
Uh, they had all kind of resources, like their flint up there. They had pottery up there, so just in case they could move up. Because this hill, at the beginning when they were here, was probably half the size. This has just been built up after, you know, floods and settlement and them burying their trash. So they would just move up. Now, as you go inside Russell Cave, we have Tennessee salamanders. We got speckled salamanders inside Russell Cave. In the uh, water, we have crayfish. We have sculpin, which is another fish. A uh, little brown fish, actually. We get snapping turtles. I saw a snapping turtle the other day jump under the water. They can get pretty big. Uh, the oldest snapping turtle on record was 150 years old. They can, they can live a good long time. Um, so, as you can see, the cave is a pretty lively place. Now, those birds you're seeing, those are swallows. Do we have any questions before we move on to the, the where they live, the shelter? Do we have any questions? Okay, let's move on here. Now, <clears throat> now let's do a little bit of a quick stop here. Now. We're, let's talk about plant life again. Out of these plants in this area, this small area, which one was most important to the prehistoric people? There's one plant here that they use in their daily lives constantly. So look around. Which one? Maple. Nope. Wasn't the maple. Cane. It was the cane. This is river cane. River cane can be quite brittle, but once it's by the river it can grow pretty tall and strong. They made uh, their spears with this, their darts, their blow guns, their cane mats, their baskets. I mean almost anything you can think of they use river cane. River cane is a cousin of bamboo and it's native to this area. So this is a, this is very important. So and that's what we'll be using once we get back. <clears throat> 